Hello, hello, and welcome to the third episode of the Weekly Waffle, your weekly dose of second monitor content. If this is your first time watching, this is basically a podcast or a ramble video where I just talk for about 30 minutes. Now I know, you see the title and you think I'm stupid, but before you slander me and tell me to get out, THERE'S THE DOOR, BITCH! I'm not calling Varlamar bad at all. There are definitely some problems, but I think Varlamar as a whole is amazing for its intended audience. Which brings me to my main point. Most of Varlamar is made for the mid-game player. Let's talk about it. But first, a message from our sponsor. It's me. I'm the sponsor. <laughs> Did you guys really think I managed to get a sponsor? I don't even have a thousand subs, bro. <laughs> but that is my current goal. 1,000 subscribers. Once we reach that goal, I'll start production on a 1k sub special that I know all of you will enjoy. Uh, it's basically me doing something incredibly dangerous on my hard requirement that none of you, I mean not a single soul, would be able to guess. So subscribe so you can see that happen. Back to the video. So what makes Varlamid so good for the mid game players? Well, everything. Except the Coliseum. The Coliseum is the only true late to end game content that was added in the expansion that has no real bearing on the mid game player. And at first, I was honestly even going to call the Coliseum mid because it's not exactly what we were promised. We were promised an end game wave based challenge where two rounds would never feel the same. But that's not really what it is. The only thing that makes it feel different are the invocations, but you can easily duplicate a run by selecting the same ones. But I haven't done it myself, so I thought it'd only be right to ask a few people who have. And the general consensus I got was that the Coliseum was actually very good. Apparently, it tests almost every aspect of your PVM skills and the boss fight is amazing. The best part of it is, is that it's not nearly as time consuming as the other wave based challenge, the Inferno. But, while talking to all these people, they gave me two main problems with the Coliseum. The first problem are the invocations, but I'm not going to talk about that because I haven't completed the Coliseum. The second problem, and really the biggest problem in my opinion, is that the Coliseum isn't really worth replaying unless you care about collection log slots or your glory. If you don't know, glory is intended to be a measure of your overall PVM skill. They made this so elitists could actively compete, supposedly showing who the best of the best is. Anyways, a big answer to the replayability issue is to offer appropriate rewards for the challenge. I think it's fair to say that most people prefer rewards fit for the challenge and they delivered on that aspect in one regard. The Dishonest Quiver. The Dishonest Quiver is an example of a proper reward. It's a new best in saw range cape that gives additional functionality and allowing us to freely switch between two ranged weapons. It's amazing for PVM but it's also amazing for a lot of lower level PK brackets too. This is truly a ward fit in the Coliseum, but just like the Inferno, you get it once and you're done. So it doesn't really add to the replayability unless you're an Iron Man and need the Sunfire Splinters. So Jagus tried to make the Coliseum replayable by monetizing it, and it's a great thought, but the amount of GP you get really isn't worth the effort, and I think a lot of that boils down to the unique rewards. Unfortunately, the rest of the unique rewards are, eh, the glaive and yes, I'm calling it the glaive because I'm not trying to pronounce the ton blah, 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 of Rallos. The glaive is basically a ranged dragon warhammer that's niche at best. Like technically, you could bring it to some bosses like Muspa if you're only using range, but it's basically just a downgrade to the Zartai crossbow because the guaranteed bolt effects are so much better. In most cases, I think you're even better off using a toxic blowpipe spec instead of this too. So is it dead content? I want to say yes, but it might be too it might be too soon to say that. And this really brings up a whole other question as to whether or not the Zarte crossbow is just too powerful. I mean, does it even leave room for the glaive to be practical anywhere? But the silver line in on this is that there might be hope for it yet because as the place promets, it might reach a point where it's actually viable as a Dragon Warhammer placeholder, which is kind of sad, but that might be its niche. 
Another reward that's surprisingly mid is the new best in slot prayer armor, the Sunfire Fanatic Armor. I didn't think I'd really be saying that, but it's true. And I'm sure the only reason it feels that way is because it's a reward from the Colosseum. Since it's a Colosseum reward, the armor will always feel pricey for what it is, which makes it pretty undesirable for the primary group of players who would even want to use the armor, mid-game players. Now of course, it's nice for higher level players doing Slayer or AFK and Vires, but all these players, even late game players, would much rather spend this GP on other gear upgrades that provide more tangible benefits instead of gear that saves a, prayer, a few prayer potions. I think the best way to exemplify why it's so mid is to compare it to Proselyte. What makes Proselyte armor so great is its high prayer bonus for the cost. Do a couple quests, spend 20k, and you have a perfect set of armor for any AFK prayer method. It's easily accessible and does the job very well. Meanwhile, Sunfire armor, it's very pricely for a small difference in defense and prayer. It's more of a luxury than a desirable purchase. Also, I think the armor looks like shit. As for the Echo Boots, I literally forgot they even existed. I don't know where you'd use them over Prims. Honestly, no one really does. They definitely need some sort of a buff because this is crazy dead content. I don't, I just don't know what they were thinking here. But yeah, the Coliseum is like a monetized inferno and some people really enjoy that. Elitists compete to try and get the highest glory and if they're enjoying it, fair. But I just feel like this is a one and done sort of activity for the majority of endgame players when it wasn't intended to be. Alright, we got the heaviest criticism of Varlamore out the way, let's move on to the mid game content discussion. So let's start with the other BVM activity that was recently added, Perilous Moons. I think that Jagex didn't market Perilous Moons for what it is. I mean they say it's heavily inspired by barrels, but when I look at it, I see baby raids which is an amazing concept for mid game players, I mean it's another way to bridge the gap between mid game and late game that just makes sense. You go in, you fight monsters, you collect resources, and once you have adequate resources, you fight the bosses and kill them. It's a similar concept to Chambers of Zarek or Corrupted Gauntlet, but it's toned down quite a bit. It's very nice. The defense mechanics within Perilous Moons also make it very appealing to mid game players because some of the best armor for the activity is also the most accessible, Barrows. If you didn't know, tank armor is greatly appreciated because the amount of damage you take is rolled off of your defensive stats and it can be very punishing if you get hit. For instance, the blood move boss heals off of the damage it does to you, but my point is, you don't need a 50 mil setup as some sort of barrier to entry. You can go in with 2 mil worth of gear and put it just fine. It's so mid game friendly that I'm actually like really impressed with Jagex. In my opinion though, the best part is that the rewards are actually desirable. The Eclipse set, but more so the Elatl, is a staple in PvP right now because it's a direct upgrade to the MSP. It hits a lot harder with the same attack speed. The Blue Moon set, which I don't understand why they changed the name. Frostmoon armor sounded way better. Anyways, the Blue Moon set, it has a lot of potential for, ver uh, for various specific PvP brackets because of its set effect, capable of dishing out a lot of DPS in 1-2 ticks. And the Blood Moon set, well the Blood Moon set exists. If you want to see these sets used to their full potential, you should check out Odoblock or Tavesta as they've already re released a few videos showcasing what they could do. One new Slayer monster found in an area near Paris Moons called the Sulfur Nagua also offers two amazing drops for mid game players. The first one is the Sulfur Blades. Now, this drop is actually mid, kind of mid, because it's a two handed weapon that's supposed to bridge the gap between 50 and 60 attack. Now, I'm all for gear progression, I think it's important, but not a lot of players are going to stay at 55 attack for long. Which is why this one's kind of mid, but I'm also trying to keep in mind, and I think some of you guys need to keep this in mind too, some content is made for different types of players. There's a surprisingly large audience of players who only log in from their mobile device or only occasionally log in that might actually find some use out of this weapon. The second drop is way better in comparison, the Sulfurous Essence. Every essence you receive can be traded in for 50 Runecraft in experience. 
Now a lot of people are put off from training runecrafting, especially at low levels, because it's so slow. So offering an additional way to get experience here and there in this skill is amazing for this group of players. Moving not too far from Perilous Moons and the Sulfur Nagua, we have a new mining activity in Cam Tara Mine. Bone Shard Mining. Now I've yet to personally test Bone Shard Mining, but here's the overall gist. You mine veins, similar to Mother of Mine, for Bone Shards. Sometimes, water will trickle down the wall, similar to Tears of Guthics, giving you double the rewards. This is amazing for mid game players because it's a low effort mining alternative that gives similar XP rates to Motherland Mining with the twist that you're essentially mining Prayer XP. This is very good for Iron Man and mid game players because Prayer XP is extremely costly or difficult or time consuming to gather. Having an alternative method to gather is amazing. Speaking of other alternatives, we have Varlamar Thieven. I've thoroughly tested this and can rate it a solid 7 out of 10. It's an absolute blessing for new players or early game Ironmen because you get a good amount of uh, prayer XP while also getting a fair amount of GP. I have two videos out right now explaining the activity and the results of it, 10 hours of thieving wealthy citizens and loot from 2k house keys, but it's basically only good for that audience. Unless you actually like the activity, it's not really worth doing because you can get quicker XP with a lot of different methods. The new runecrafting method that was introduced, Sunfire Runecrafting, it's fairly high XP per hour, but to get the most value out of it, you really have to have high runecrafting already and Desert Treasure 2 completed so that you have access to Twisted Extracts. So this is a piece of content primarily for late game players who really want to quickly crush out runecrafting for their maxcape or have a profitable way of runecrafting. So I'm not really going to talk about it. But don't let that stop you from trying it as a mid game player if you really want. And that brings us to the last edition Varlamore brought, the Hunter's Guild. The Hunter's Guild brought a fair bit of content into the game, but we're not going to dive into every single item of our NPC, we're just going to talk about the notable content. So. First up on the list are Mixed Hide Boots. Now, I know, these boots seem pretty lackluster and it might even seem stupid for me to talk about them, but believe me when I say that these boots are actually very nice. Early and even in some cases, mid-game Ironmen, they can make great use of these boots as they have a higher range bonus than snakeskin boots and they also have the same strength bonus as climbing boots. Personally, I'm even delaying the grind for rangers on my Ironman because these boots are just so good. I'm also using them until I get rune boots and maybe even dragon boots since they have the same strength bonus as rune boots. But seriously, this item is extremely underrated. Plus, having a piece of gear that's over like overall generic in use is amazing for players without many hours. You know, without many hours in the game on total, not on one account. You know, they won't need to fuss over many options when they can just settle on one for the time being until they learn more about the game. Next up. The Hunter's Sunlight Crossbow. This weapon is amazing, despite how obnoxious it looks. It's a one-handed crossbow with the same attack speed as a short bow, with cheap ammunition that's on par with amethyst arrows or dragon arrows, depending on which bolts you use. It's capable of doing a lot of DPS to low defense targets, which makes this item amazing for low to mid-level PKing. It's okay for PVM if you use it anywhere that you'd normally use a magic short bow, or ruin arrows and broad bolts. My main concern with this weapon pre-release was that the bolts would be too time consuming to attain on Iron Man, but you can actually get a decent amount of them per hour while farming Sun's Fire Splinters. It's great. It's really good. But let's talk about part of the update that's definitely geared towards mid-game players but came to the game a little too late. The new Hunter food. On paper, it's amazing and sounds like something that should have been added to the game a very long time ago, and it would have been amazing if it was in the game a long time ago, but nowadays the practicality of it, I'm not so sure. You typically want to use this food anytime you know you'd be in combat for prolonged periods of time. The problem is, there isn't a lot of content like that anymore. RuneScape has changed quite a bit. Back in the day, people used to be able to do very long trips, or people used to do very long trips at Ankus, Gargoyles, or Karas, and they would camp beasts for money, but that's not really the case anymore. 
most areas in the game are extremely easy to access so you can quickly restock and sometimes that's even more efficient than just staying there for prolonged periods of time. And half the reason people stayed in an area for a prolonged period of time was because it was very competitive. People were actively trying to like compete to kill gargoyles and you actually struggled to find a spot so you really wanted to stay there. That's not the case now. Areas like this are completely dead. Some players might try to use this food as like an alternative to brews, and there might be some cases where that's viable, like the fight caves. That might be a perfectly acceptable place to use it. But outside of that, I mean, some higher level players might be able to make it work, but the majority of players are going to really appreciate the full healing effect of like sharks or manta rays instead of like a delayed healing effect. It's just more useful for Boston, especially because they're going to make more mistakes. Finally, we have Hunter's Rumors. Hunter Rumors are basically Hunter Slayer tasks. Completed them rewards you with different tiers of Hunter Loot Sacks depending on the Hunter tier you completed. It's not the best XP per hour, but it's a fantastic alternative that's very much welcome because training Hunter at low level is AIDS. The rewards are good in general, giving a decent profit margin along with prayer XP, and a chance at the new, and maybe the sickest pet in the game, the Keetzel. But all the drops are especially good for Iron Man. A lot of people have also pointed out that rumors unfortunately highlight a lot of the awful content in Hunter since you're forced to hunt them, and I think that's a fair statement, and I think that's fair criticism. I think to make those undesirable pieces of content more tolerable, they should buff the XP rates on certain methods during a rumor. It doesn't have to be a flat increase across every method, but if everyone hates tracking because they think it's not worth the time or effort, maybe make it a little more worthwhile, at least during a rumor. And as a side note, I know I keep mentioning how great everything is for Iron Man, and that's mostly because any improvement to the average player's mid-game is amazing for Iron Man, because Iron Man are perpetually using content from the mid-game. So, I waffled quite a bit in this one, and kind of went off the main topic quite a bit, but as you can see, Varlamar really was geared towards a mid-game player. So if you didn't enjoy this expansion, it's probably because you're a late to end game player that can't be bothered with any of the new content. If you love Varlamar, you're either an Iron Man, a mid game player, or you're a peak hair abusing the Atlatl. So that's about all I have for you guys in this episode. I know it's a little shorter than the others, but I'm just very busy right now, so I can only talk about so much. In other news, I'm starting to work on the 8th episode of my Hardcore Iron Man series. I'm excited to share all my progress with you gamers, so expect that video sometime soon. With all that being said, I'm done waffling. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you gamers in the next episode of the Weekly Waffle.